Um, this image that I start with is actually the coastline of Mersey Island in Essex. Uh, I'm very fond of this coastline. Uh, it's seriously being eroded. And really what I want to talk about in the next 30, 35 minutes is the notion of kind of an edge condition and how the beach uh, or the coastline is a, a particular kind of focal point or a locus of how you can see change happening environmentally, socially, and historically as well. Um, and for the last, I mean, as Dan said, basically I've worked mostly in public policy as a freelance researcher and writer, and I've worked for various think tanks and occasionally for the government. Um, so there's always a kind of policy agenda behind everything I've been able to do. But being able to travel, doing this kind of research, you know, I've always had a secondary interest in lit the literature of place. And um, coming from Essex, as I do, which has often been regarded as a rather benighted part of England, uh, in, the, at the end, in 1987, some people may recall, some people probably won't, uh, that when the election results were announced, the first announcement came about 55 minutes after polls closed in Basildon to say that Basildon had gone Conservative which was a big kind of bit for me, a bit of a cultural shock. And I think it was for the general. And it began this kind of national debate or discussion, if you like, about how this one particular county, Essex, had kind of, um, it was being transformed from within, politically and culturally, and nobody really could kind of fix a position on, on how to understand this. And so since for the last 20, 25 years, I've been involved in this thing which I call my Essex project, which is a completely personal thing, which is trying to understand the nature of change, particularly in Essex, and because the conference is called local modernism, Essex is a, is a certain very discreet locality, and it's one which I think really has been a kind of laboratory in the 20th century for changing notions of Englishness and place and landscape and identity. And it's a, it's a project that I think I'm really very involved in trying to kind of understand. Um, to start with, for example, when I began reading the kind of travel literature about Essex, if you book, look at most books on East Anglia, they don't include Essex. It's Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridge. If you look at things about the home counties, Essex is not really included as a home county either. It's got this strange, it's kind of London by the sea, and it has a very complicated relationship with London. For example, my, both my parents grew up in the East End of London, and at the, uh, and at the age of six we moved to Canby Island, uh, which uh, luckily we only were there for 18 months before the Great Flood in 1953, and then we moved out to South End. I went to grammar school there. I met my wife there came from a Jewish family from East End London who'd gone out to Westcliff, as lots of Jewish families did from East End London, to start a new life. So that kind of relationship between London, migra out-migration, changing in the kind of culture of the coastal uh, towns and so on, is it, really very important. Um, when I say that Essex, you know, is a kind of laboratory... Part of one, the first thing I became very interested in, historically, was at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, because of its proximity to London, you began to get a number of experimental communities established in Essex, partly because land was cheap following the uh, rural depression of the 1870s, 1880s. But you got kind of anarchists, Tolstoyans, Fabians, Salvation Army, various Christian groups, going out there trying to set up new kind of forms of community, back to the land, new social relations, living communally. And Essex really was a kind of centre of this, part, obviously a lot to do with its proximity to London. And I have been looking at those over the last 15 years and recording them and even, and even trying to trace the remains, the, literally the physical remains of some of the structures of some of those experimental communities, and the most recent book I did, The New English Landscape, with the photographer Jason Orton, we went and photographed the, the last um, 
greenhouses or glass houses of the, the rather well established utopian community of Mayland Sea on the River Blackwater. And that again, you know, this kind of going out to the coast or going out to the margins is part of that um, sense of getting away from things. Um, another project I've been involved in was interviewing people who set up the Othona community. It was a religious community established in 1945 by, Christian, by German and English Christians after the war in the spirit of reconciliation. And they took over some old army Nissen huts out of Bradham on the sea, right out of March. It's very close to here. And they're still going uh, since 1945. But people visit it. You don't have to be Christian. You can be any kind of religion. It's a place of sanctuary, a place of the tree where people talk to each other and kind of, you know, rebuild their lives, if you like, or rebuild some sense of international relationships. Um, so this notion of kind of having a, an edge position allows, I think, people to kind of look outwards and backwards at the same time. And for me, it is kind of the fact that Essex has 350 miles of coastline, um, which makes it very susceptible to kind of these uh, being a place of location for experimental communities. Now, in the 90s, I collected all this stuff about Essex social history. I wanted to do a book about it. Um, and I did all the appropriate things that the publishers require, you know, the first of the outline, then some chapters, I wrote some chapters. They were totally publishers interested, but they said that... Um, what they wanted was the story of Essex Man, because after the 1987 election, the national media had kind of developed this notion that there was an Essex Man, a new kind of cultural formation, a working class Tory, with his partner, not always, uh, uh, Essex Woman, who was a kind of consumerist, uh, glad, glad time girl, uh, and that somehow this was the new England. And I said, well, it's not the book I wanted to write. I wanted to kind of try and work out where all, what the social history of all this change had been, been, had been happening. Because apart from the experimental communities, you know, Fords, you know, it was a major industrial area. Fords had 40,000 people working out in Essex. Um, there were all, and there was a major defence area. And the first of the great public housing projects in the beginning of the 20th century for example, the Beckentree Estate, 30,000 homes built by the London County Council, was out in Essex. So it's always this kind of place where new experiments in social relations were attempted. And of course, the new towns after the Second World War. Um, so the publishers wanted one thing, and I wanted to do another. And I had this 100,000 words, in, in, and I had five big file boxes of files. I had everything there, and I couldn't find a way of presenting this material. Um, which is where I, I was very lucky, because in 2005, uh, it was the year of the coast, and uh, a photographer called Jason Alton had been commissioned by Essex County Council to do a series of pho a photographic essay on the Essex coastline, which is, as I said, famously, it's 350 miles long. And he'd done this whole series of images, a bit like the one I just showed you, but that, that's mine, that wasn't his. He's a much better photographer than me. And when he took it, you know, took all the, this kind of photo essay uh, to the Arts Department of Essex County Council in the celebration of Essex, the year of the coast, they took one look and said that well, the politicians are not going to like this at all. Because they had hope for kind of beach hunts, sunsets, <laughs> um, you know, ice cream, candy floss, happiness. And what Jason produced was a series of images of post industrial landscapes, uh, former arms, arms areas, wildlife centres, uh, working shipyards, um, small villages utopian experimental communities and so on. And they said, well, the politicians are not going to like it. They won't publish this. What are we going to do? And I had met Jason before. Jason came to me and said, look, 
can you help? Because the only way you can get away with these photographs is if, if there is some kind of social historical essay, text to go with it, which will kind of explain why this is a true, not, you can't never have a true representation, of why this is a meaningful representation of what contemporary Essex is. And that was, very, to me, incredibly, it was a complete eye change. It moved, well, everything changed because I think it may be useful to you, I hope, because all I had to do was write 9,000 words, not, not writing, addressing the photographs particularly, but simply providing a short uh, 9,000 word essay on the social history of Essex as a kind of experimental landscape. And in that 9,000 words, with, along with Jason's photographs, I was able to say everything I wanted to say about Essex that I couldn't say in 100,000 words of text. And now I'm completely, absolutely wedded to the mixture of photography and text as a way of getting closer to the heart of place and time uh, and memory. Uh, and, and I've since worked, well, I've now been working with Jason for 10 years. So 350 Miles was the publication, and um, some of the politicians still didn't like it, but others could begin to see what we were going, what we were on about. And we actually, Jason and I literally did walk the whole 350 miles of the Essex coast uh, over time. Um, and then we followed that up more recently with um, a book that tries to go deeper into what is the nature of kind of contemporary landscape aesthetics that we take as a starting point uh, the Council of Europe resolution that landscape is a very important part of people's identity. Um, and, you know, we should learn how to value them. And why I was very interested in ad kind of ad representing Essex as a kind of new form of Englishness is because after the war, and I'm getting around to the back of the playground in a minute, after the war, apart from as a result of the war, it seemed to me the locus of land landscape identity in England moved significantly from the west to the east. Prior to the war, it was the Cotswolds, it was the Devon, Cornwall, Lake District, and so on, that was somehow represented as being quintessentially English landscape. But after the war, it all moved east. And East Anglia, the Fens, the Thames Estuary particularly, became a kind of uh, new um, a new way of thinking about what was changed, what was happening to Englishness and English, English identity. Um, and it's a very old map of Essex, um, and you can see actually it's 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 got major major rivers everywhere, major estuaries. It's got about five. Um, inhabited islands, Canary Island, where I lived briefly for two years, uh, population probably now 15,000, Mersey Island up there, population 5,000. Um, so it's a very unusual landscape, um, and, uh, and, and partly it also feels very isolated. Uh, although it is close to London, the roads don't kind of go out that way, they go up and down. So you they're really um, on other means. So we started when Jason and I were talking about this. Well, you know, clearly Essex was a great place for recreation, fun, seaside holidays. And uh, this is actually taken an August Bank holiday on South End Beach a few years ago. I was walking then with Jules Pretty, who's now Vice Chancellor of Essex University. He, he walked the whole coastline as well. I joined him for a while. Um, but this really happened in the 1930s. Uh, in the beginning of the 1930s, I think there were only a million people in Britain had paid holidays. But after 1938, when there was holidays with pay act introduced, 11 million people suddenly became, had paid holidays. And it produced this enormous transformation of the coastline, very strong in East Anglia. 
as a place of pleasure. So the first holiday camps were Skegness, Clacton, and obviously South End, uh, Westcliff, and lots of other places became very big tourist attraction. So, you know, the, the beach became celebrated as this place of fun, hedonism, healthy bodies, and so on. Um, and I think I'm, I want to go back a bit because this movement east I think is yeah okay that happened then but people were always beginning artists particularly were beginning to see the beach not simply as a, as a playground which it was and the, the, this afternoon or later on this morning we're going to hear about Sussex surrealism the surrealists also arrived at the beach roughly at the same time. Famously, um, I think we may have the name. Yeah, uh, Paul Nash. Um, this was this uh, painting is called Battle of Britain, painted in 1941. 41. Um, but before then, he painted uh, pictures of Swanage, which were clearly surrealist paintings, very famously with over enlarged tennis balls. Cliffs, very strange objects, kind of prehistoric objects in the landscape as well. Um, and in 1938, the artist John Pipe had written a very influential essay called Abstraction on the Beach. So the beach was kind of becoming a place of pleasure, recreation, but it was also becoming a place that was producing various kinds of weird organic formations. Bill Brandt was another one who photographed the beach, a very unusual kind of uh, context, a very exaggerated um, black and white, very close-ups, fisheye lenses and so on. So it began to occupy this strange space in the English imagination. But then, and, and another artist who I'm rather fond of, Brunella Clough, painted this in 1942, which is near Albra, and it's called um, Win Boats in Winter, and sea defences. So, by the middle of the Second World War, the whole of the East Anglian coast was fortified. There was barbed wire, there were vast tank traps, um, and obviously pillboxes everywhere. In the First World War, um, something like 300,000 men, uh, at, at, literally at the outbreak of the First World War, went into Essex to construct the fortifications. And so the beach, which had <coughs> Only for a brief, you know, for a relatively brief period, been this ideal of kind of leisure and pleasure suddenly became this notion of a fortification, and that I think is very interesting. That that has remained. A lot of those structures have remained in place, and from time to time you do get uh, in East Anglia some someone wants to demolish something, and now I think people are very committed to the idea that actually that defensive structure is now an organic part of the landscape and should not be destroyed because uh, it represents a particularly important part of our history. And that brings me into a, an issue that we could discuss, um, well I hope we will discuss it, which is what we do about uh, industrial and uh, military remains. Uh, there, are, there are a number of sociologists now, and, and including one very fine religious sociologist uh, who, who works out of um, Sheffield, who have been appalled by the absolute obliteration of the mining industry in some parts of Britain. You would not know that anything had ever existed there. And this kind of effacement of the past in the name of kind of modernity or in the name of making a fresh start I think is now something that we really have to discuss very importantly because industrial ruins, defensive ruins, really have become part of the landscape. Um, so the, these edge lands, these post-industrial, these post-military places, I think now occupy a very important part of imagination. I'm also reminded that sometime later today someone is talking about Sylvia Townsend Wall, uh, who loved the Essex Marshlands and wrote a wonderful book called The True Heart uh, 
um, about um, the strange, eerie landscape of the Essex estuaries. But she also focused on one of the Essex had, from the 1870s, had a religion only found in Essex. It was the peculiar people. And uh, Sylvia Townsend Warman is about that particular uh, Christian sect uh, who only, uh, uh, in the 1960s, rejoined the United Reformed Church. So again, it's to do with those edge conditions producing, they're not deformations, but they're new kind of growths or special, um, they're kind of distinctive species, which is also true of islands, um, of which Essex has several on the coastline. Only two years ago, staying on Mersey Island, I woke up one morning and looked out where I was staying and there were some red squirrels. Now, red squirrels allegedly have uh, been, you know, they don't exist in England anymore, but actually they do on Mersey and they do on the Isle of Wight. Um, so Ireland's again kind of um, part of outgrowths or outposts of both religious, social and environmental uh, conditions that are not normally found on the main. Uh, so the Pineda Clough, um, and I want, oh yes, yeah, so and then I mentioned the Piper's abstraction on the beach. So this is just uh, 300 yards away from that opening photograph. This is still on Mersey Island. And this is one of the something like 11,000 pillboxes still extant in the landscape, uh, which are now re regarded very affectionately and properly by the people who live there. They do seem now to form a natural part of the landscape. The other interesting thing, of course, about those edge conditions, and particularly about the military occupation of much of East Anglia during the Second World War, partly for air drones, the US Air Force were over here, um, there's a lot of training going for D-Day, is that after the war, a lot of it remained in military hands, Town S Island was still in military hands, and because people weren't allowed there, it has produced, paradoxically, a much wider range of flora and fauna uh, uh, there, because nobody's allowed to go there. So paradoxically, the military are unconsciously doing the job of kind of creating safe habitat for um, <laughs> lots of unusual uh, things, species, and so on. Um, and this is back to the the wartime ruins all along the beach of, of, of East Anglia. This is the flood map on the, on the, the first verse of January 1953 was commemorated, I thought it was one year ago, two years ago. Um, 300 people died in one night during this flood. This is where I used to live in Calgary Island. We moved up to here a year before the flood. 53 people died on Canby alone that night. And only two years ago, something like the same conditions uh, developed one night in October that could have produced something similar. So, again, people in these coastlines do develop a, a very different relationship to the landscape to do with a sense of threat and um, not vulnerability. But flux, even today, and I was there on Mersey Island last week, there are times when you can't get on or off the island because the tide is so high. It covers the road, and that's true of a number of the other islands. The causeways are covered over. So people have to still live in relationship to the natural forces of time and time. And as one famous Essex biologist said, Two-thirds of the most interesting parts of the Essex landscape are underwater um, half, the, half, the, half the year. But you can see how vulnerable and soft, as it were, this coastline is. And what's been very interesting and very controversial in the last 20 years is that until uh, initially after the 1953 flood, the notion was higher concrete walls, stronger bulwark defences to stop the tide. And actually, the new thinking is that we can't. And actually it's called managed retreat, which 
I think politically it's a very interesting uh, uh, Gramscian kind of notion um, that they're, they're actually taking down a lot of the sea wall so that the sea can naturally flood into particular part arable land and so on, but not build up pressure uh, and then kind of overrun in the flood. Key please. I mentioned earlier about this move to the east. I think another very significant element in this uh, in the last 15, 20 years, and I'm enormously grateful to Ian Sinclair because he, his first book, I think you will find, is Down River. It's about the Pool of London going out towards the estuary, very much in the spirit of Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness. And I've never been able to trace this, and everybody could ever trace this um, quote, I'd be enormously grateful, I've been trying to thank you. I, I remember reading about 20 years ago that W.B. Yeats said that the English imagination was divided into two parts, the Upper Thames and the Lower Thames. In the Upper Thames, you've got those Henry James novels, Portrait Lady, Long Lawns Lead Down to the River, Tea in the Afternoon, House in Bay, Wind in the Willows, um, Stanley Spencer of Marlowe, Swan Up in Marlowe, or Oxford University, all that pastoral willow stuff. There's all that kind of Englishness. And then there's Lower Thames, which is Conrad, which is the docks, which is the industrial history, which is tough, which is where all the bad things of London, the fever hospitals, the sewage works, um, the industry, the noxious industries, the leather tanning, uh, the prison ships, all that went east, down there. And part, you know, uh, and, and respect to Ian Sinclair was that he kind of brought this back into the discussion about the English landscape, whether you want to call it psychogeography or what's that, whatsoever. And then I think very, as importantly, W.G. Sable became very fascinated by East Anglia. What I, I especially think is important about Seaboard is that he connected it to European history. He, you know, in his kind of perorations on Liverpool Street Station, the train link to Harwich and then the cross channel uh, train thing in Eastern Europe, it's where the in the transport of children, refugees, Jewish refugees from Germany in 1939 came, that actually Seaboard brings East Anglia and London into the mainstream of the terrors and horrors of 20th century European history, which the kind of view to the West was kind of precluded. So, and I don't want to overdo this, but I mean, very interestingly, that all the big nature writers of the last few years are all around Cambridge, Helen, Donald, Donald Farley, Dr. Deakin, it's a kind of Cambridge thing. Uh, which is not quite the same thing as the Thames Estuary thing, but this thing about trying to understand the eastern region, the eastern shoreline, is very important. And especially now, and I, you know, because it's, it's absolute UKIP territory. If you look at a map of UKIP voting, it goes all, it just goes up from Margate all around the coast up to Lincolnshire, Humberside. And why? I don't know. I mean, we must try to find out. So, lastly, I'm very interested. Um, no, 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 I was just. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in this notion of, of the beach as a kind of liminal space looking outwards to a bigger world, to, um, uh, to something kind of slightly more uh, ethereal. Transcendental uh, 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 and, and turn your back on what's in there. A very famous image from a favourite of mine, Caspar David Friedrich, the month, month by the sea from 1812, I think. But the, the, the very big picture about the coast or the shore as a place where all values are tested 
and where faith is lost or found again is William Peggle's painting of, um, sorry, William Dyson's painting of Peggle's Beach, 1858. And this is the great painting of where is God? They're looking, they're, it's kind of, it's mournful, God has disappeared, the tide is out, the world seems empty, people are finding fossils on the beach. There's a record that actually says that the world wasn't made 4,000 years ago by God. It's old and it's worn out and we don't know where we what to do. Uh, and that was our part, obviously, echo in Matthew Arnold's plan over the beach. And lastly, so when, when I was with um, Jules, Pretty. We, we walked uh, along from Bentley on that, on that particular bank holiday Monday to Falmouth Island. We managed to get a pass on to Falmouth Island. Uh, and along Southland Beach, we saw at least four large religious gatherings on the beach, uh, which kind of reaffirmed this notion that it is this space uh, that gives people an opportunity both to look outwards and, and to think about the, the wider, bigger things uh, and turn your back on the problems inland, so to speak. So, this is kind of what I now call my Essex, the Essex Project. I've been going for about 20 years um, and I still do a lot of walking and, and talking to people about it. Um, and I am often asked the question, why did Essex... Why does the politics so change? Because Essex... You know, with, when Falls was there and all the heavy industry was there, was you know a working class, um, labour voting kind of place, and now it seems to seems to be a place of very mixed identities, partly to do with migration, out migration, partly to do with the failure of certain kinds of experiments in the new towns and so on, which gave people kind of anxieties about their identity, they, did, they were no longer London, they didn't know where they had a sure identity and they didn't know where they were. But, but the beach or the coast or the seashore is this amazing place, I think, in which you can, and on the eastern coastline, I think, which the history of 20, Englishness in the 20th century has been written most uh, clearly. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.